Hey, welcome to another episode of the Delayed Gratification Podcast, where we talk about building wealth and what all goes into it. Listen, y'all, get your pen out, get your paper out. It's going to be life-changing. I got my man here. I'm going to say one of my mentors that I haven't paid yet, right? But I watch him. He inspires me. And uh, we're going to talk a lot, but we're going to talk about real estate, y'all. This is the king of commercial real estate. We got to get him on some more magazine covers and things. What's up, King? What's up, sir? Man, How you listen, doing? thank you for being here today, right, man. Right. Listen, tell them who you are, and then I want to jump right into mm-hmm. what you've been preaching and why you preach it. Okay. My name is Akeen Africa, um, Cle- from Cleveland, Ohio, also here in Atlanta, Georgia, part time. Uh, I've been doing real estate since I was 19, 51, 31 plus, plus years. Purchased my first house, made, you know, $6,500 investment, invested seven grand, got a check for 65000 changed my life. It was a done deal. What got you started, though? Um, I had the opportunity to meet or I had the opportunity to interact with the individual that I was in the streets with. When I was 19, he was like 22, 23. And back then, I was like an OG to a 19-year-old. <laughs> yeah. um, when we were go, went to go meet to do our business, you know, we would meet at another house that he had just purchased. And I'm like, what's this? He's like, man, this is what, you know, you need to be doing with your money. I just bought a house. At like, he bought a though. house. He was 22, 23. Wow. I'm like, a house, man. Let me get my thing where I can get it moving. I got to get back to the block, right? So I got it moved. And the next week, I went to go meet him <clears throat> at another house. Who house is this? OG? Man, it's my house. I told you this is what you need to be doing with your money. I said, okay. Maybe a month later, I'm with a guy my same age. He might have only been either 19 or 20. We were very similar in age. And we were riding doing our one two. I just bought a Cherokee, went to go pick him up, like, let's roll. And he like, all right, run me over here to um, East Cleveland. I need to make a stop. I'm like, man, you know, we can't make no money. No, this is legitimate. I'm like, all right. So we pull up in this apartment complex. I'm like, what are we doing here? He like, I need to collect the rent. I'm like, what do you mean collect rent? He like, I own, me and my dude, we own these. What? Hey, man, what we was planning on doing, I got to go. You know what I mean? I dropped him back off, called my one of my my other OGs that I know he was buying real estate too, and said, man, I want to buy real estate right now, today. Because, you know, having somebody who you consider you look up to, it seems unattainable or they on a different mindset. Mm-hmm. But having somebody in your, what we call our peer group, it seems more realistic. So it's more like a direct connection. So right then and there, he took me up to the real estate office on Lee, Lee Road. It was called Classic Real Estate. He walked me in, said, this my little dude. He want to buy some real estate. Within two weeks later, I bought my first property. At 19? At 19. And then I bought another one while I was still 19. I bought three while I was 19. You still got them? No, nah, no. Nah, I, I, uh, except one. The, the the one that I bought that I moved in, it was a two family at that time. I was living, me and my mother was living in the project, 75th and Willing, East Willing Estates in Cleveland, Ohio, at that time when I bought my first uh, three properties. So once I started buying some properties, I said I need to get me and my mother out the projects. So I um, bought a two family house, put her downstairs, I moved upstairs. So I still own that property, but now I handed it off to my son. You, so 30 years later, you still got it? Yeah, yeah, well... My son has it. Son. I literally gave it to my son probably six or seven years ago. And he live in the house. He live upstairs and he got a tenant living he live downstairs. In your spot. He live in my spot. <laughs> yeah, he live in my spot. So, so 30 years ago, you started buying. Mm-hmm. Man, you preach it. You teach it. You show us. Mm-hmm. You wanted to, like, like, seriously. And I know a lot of people may or may not know you, mm-hmm. right? But what makes you teach it the way you teach it? Ah, oh, man, because I, I truly, truly believe if I can do it, anybody can. I know how it is to be in that situation that being exposed to what I thought was success, Mm -hmm. dudes in the streets, whether they robbing, killing, pimping, being the hanging on the corners, that's how we measured ourselves, right? From what we was able to reach out and touch on a daily basis. So I know what it feels like to feel like that's, that's the highest that I can go, right? 
being in the neighborhood, being in the community, being off 131st, being in the projects, being in the situation that the nicest things that I've seen, whether it's clothing, whether it's cars, whether it's people, how they live in, however they was getting their money, for me, that was the that was far as my dreams it went. So once I not voluntarily was removed from that environment and put myself in a situation I went to prison and start picking up the right books and reading that hold on you can you know you you're not restrained by the environment that you come from you're not restricted to just those four walls i understood it was you can literally go as high as your imaginary imagine how how high you can imagine it can go Right. Whatever you can visually see, you can literally put your physical self there if you can visually see it and believe it. So in let, your me, mind. let me stop you, though. You say you went mm -hmm. to prison. Yes, sir. Now, I didn't know you before you went to prison. Yeah. But I met you afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. And for me, you're very successful mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, to me, too. <laughs> to, I mean, if we know you, we know. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think prison changed your perspective? Because you had already started buying real estate. Yeah. But what do you No, nah, that's that's not true. So I actually I so I've been to prison. I did juvenile time. Okay. When I was fifteen to sixteen, I went back seventeen to eighteen. Okay. I went back literally at nineteen. I'm, I'm sorry, I went back at eighteen. I came home when I was nineteen. But that's when you started buying. I bought the real estate, okay. but I still went back to prison. So just where you understand, even I went up I went back to prison two more times. Wow. I never caught a drug case in my life. I sold drugs from the age of 15 to 19. Never went back, never sold drugs again, never caught a drug case. My issue was guns. Once I got caught with that, I shot somebody when I was a teen. I was still in cars when I was a teen. I went to juvenile, came home, shot somebody when I was 18, went in when I was 18, came home when I was 19. You were still a kid, though, really. I was still a kid. Yeah. I was still immature, but my issue was the guns. It was the violence, you know, that that was my issues. I never caught a drug case in my life. I got out the drug game when I was 19, but even when I got out, I still got caught up in that that street credibility. I'm still I'm still that guy and I have to represent that guy. It don't matter if I'm getting legal money, you know what I mean? I'm around I'm around animals. You know what I mean? Mentally animals, not physically animals and we had an animal mentality. So I always had to represent that. My last case, just to jump to that real quick, was I was 1,000% legitimate. Mm. Every day, I opened my first business. I had a clothing store on Lee and Chagrin and Shaker Heights. Anybody from Cleveland know that's a very um, upscale suburb in Cleveland. I opened my fir first clothing store. Opened up a second one 10 months later in Euclid, Ohio, on Lakeshore. I was driving a 740 BMW. I was driving a, a Cadillac Escalade. You like them cars. I like them cars, always have. <laughs> I'm running my business every day. I'm in my business every day. Somebody broke into business one night, stole some fur coats. Shaker police come to my house. That two family that I bought, I was still living. They come to the door. Hey, we need you to come up to your store to secure it. Somebody broke in. I went up. I grabbed my... In my pants, I kept a 22 Dillinger in my coin pocket mm -hmm. of my jeans. So that was natural. When I threw on my pants, it was already on me, right? I went to the store. I seen that, you know, the window needed to be repaired. I called one of my dudes. He said, I can be there at 8, 9 in the morning. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I called my girl and said, listen, I'm going to stay in the store. I'm going to sleep in the store. Bring, me a, bring my 9 up here. I'm going to sleep with my 9 just in case somebody come back. She brought it up. Make a long story short, later on that day, I'm driving down the street, leaving the store. I see the dudes with my stuff. I could have called 911. <laughs> I could have called Shaker Police. I could have, but unfortunately, I was still stuck in that mindset. Like, oh, I'm, this is me. I can't. It's your stuff. I can't call the police on somebody. I'm the police. Yeah. I police my own situation. Jumped out, make a long story short. You know, did I went back did. to jail. Did the OJ. I went back to jail. Yeah. Five and a half more years. Now, wow. going to jail when you know you was a street guy and going to jail when you know you were mentally thought you changed because mm -hmm. I was delusional. 
I thought I can ride the fence. I thought I can be 100% legitimate, but still walk the path of a street guy. You can't. It's impossible. You can't do both. You got to do one or the other. You got to do one or the other. You got to get on or off the fence. You can't ride the fence. You can't mm -hmm. straddle the fence forever. And that's the last time I went to prison. It was the best thing that ever happened to me, Why? believe it or not. Oh, it forced me to say you was 100% legitimate. You getting legal money. You live in the American dream. Most people in the hood thought I was successful then. In my mind, I thought it was successful. I owned, a, 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 I owned the building of a restaurant, the, a, a club. I owned real estate, four or five properties. I drove the BMW to Escalade. I kept... You know, six figures in the bank. I kept another 50, 60 stash in the coat closet. You know what I mean? And I thought I was successful. How long ago was this, though? When this was in 1992. Okay. 1992. So you went to, to prison in 92. No, I'm sorry. This was in 2002. 2002. I went back in 2003. I caught the case in 2001 while I, I stayed out on appeal for over a year. I went in in 2003, came home in 2008. That was my last time. So now we're talking five about five and a half years. So we're talking about fourteen years ago. Fourteen years. So in ago. the past fourteen years, yeah, you've amassed, uh, yeah, fortune. Bro. I came home with zero, broke. Did you? Nothing. I lost everything. Why? I lost everything that I had within the first year and a half. I was gone on a five and a half year bit. Everything except gone that, except that one house, the one two except family. the one house. But but believe it or not, I lost because that was in foreclosure. My <clears> people got refinanced and took money out. So when I came home, that was in foreclosure too. So that was on the verge of being lost too. So you came home with zero, but you had a zero. different mentality. Uh, totally different. That was the, so I really came home rich, richer than I had ever been. Cause I had knowledge. I was hungry. You know, I, I had information that I'd never had before. I literally, when I went to prison, I thought being rich and being wealthy was the exact same thing. I thought it was the difference between tomato or tomato. And it's not. It's absolutely not. So you come home 2008? Yes, sir. 2008. Broke. Broke. Halfway house. Halfway house, 2008. What happened? What happened oh, from now man. to then? Because, listen, mm -hmm. man, when I, I light up, bro. Every time you, I, I see you on, you know, Beyond yeah. Post, I, you know, we have conversations. Yeah, yeah, I come yeah, to Cleveland. Yeah. Like, what happened? What did you do next? I was dead broke. Yeah, dead broke. The first hustle I had, believe it or not, was Craigslist. If anybody can remember Craigslist before, <laughs> you know, offer up and Facebook Marketplace, we had a little simple thing called, called Craigslist. Yeah. Literally, I bought items on Craigslist mm -hmm. every morning. I got up, got on my girl's computer. You didn't have a computer. I didn't have nothing. Yeah. Nothing. I got on my girl's computer. I scanned Craigslist for the postings the night before. And I specifically looked for distress stories. I need these. I need, you know, I just kicked my boyfriend out. I need his stuff out of my house as soon as possible. I'm cleaning out my garage. I need to clean out my garage. Whoever can come get this stuff. I looked for those specific stories. And I bought those items. Mm -hmm. And I reposted them back on Craigslist. I made my first $20,000 in less than 90 days doing that. Cash, profit. Mm -hmm. I bought my first vehicle on Craigslist. It was a red cargo van. I called it Lil Red. I paid $2,200 from an Asian dude. It had 100,000 miles on it when I first bought it. I drove that van for about 13, 14 months. That was my everyday vehicle. It was a literally a cargo van. It just had two seats in there, and it was raggedy. But I ended up, when I finally, finally got rid of it about four or five years ago, I had about 350,000 miles. Hold on. You said you, you just sold it four or five years ago? About four or five years So you ago. kept it for about 10 years? Well, not bad. I kept it within my network. <laughs> I kept, I let the, one of the restaurants use it. They okay. were using it. They used it, yeah. They put about 200,000 miles on it. Yeah, so I used that van to pick up materials that I bought. And I used that van to deliver materials that I was selling off Craigslist. So I made my first 20 grand in like 90 days. And I took that 20,000 and opened up a restaurant. What made you open up a restaurant? Well, because I was from, my mother owned a restaurant. My father was in the restaurant business. And for me, the restaurant business is like riding a bike. Okay. I grew up in that business. Um, I had had a restaurant before I went to prison. So I knew the business. I knew how to run a business, and I knew how to run a restaurant business. 
Um, I felt like I can um, get some cash flow going with the restaurant business. With the restaurant okay. business, really quickly. Um, it's a very dangerous game to play to do what I was doing in the restaurant business, but I knew that I needed to do it. That was the easiest thing for me to get quick cash. Why do you say it was dangerous? Because the restaurant business is 1,000% the most volatile business in the world. More restaurants open and close than any other business. So I knew that I wasn't going to be in it for the long term, mm -hmm. but I can use the cash flow to get me back into real estate. That's all I was trying to do. Get back into the real estate. That's it. So basically, it's the concept of robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? The great thing about the restaurant business, most of those big bills are due every 30 days. Mm -hmm. I felt like if I can bring in that cash, right, put those bills off, put that cash in the real estate, bring some money in from that, and then pay those bills. You were juggling. I was juggling. So, but the restaurant business, it took off for me so quickly, um, which was a blessing. Uh, I ended up buying more, opening more restaurants very quickly. So within, um, I, I literally opened 10 restaurants in 10 years. Did you? Yeah. 10 restaurants in 10 years. Are you still in the restaurant business? As an investor, okay. not as an operator. Yeah. What the restaurant business itself, were you buying the buildings or just nope. leasing the buildings? Starting or? off, I was just leasing. I was negotiating. I felt like I'm one of the best negotiators in the world. I was going in negotiating the best deals that I can. Um, just milking every dollar I can out of the spaces and out of the business, reinvesting half of the money back into the restaurant and the other half in the real estate. So I started, the blessing was, if you think about what year I came home, think yeah. about that. It was, it was a great collapse. It was phenomenal. And the best thing about that is when I came home in 2008, I didn't have any cash to buy at that time, right? Mm -hmm. The market was falling, but it still didn't hit the bottom yet. People talk about 08, but they don't understand that the bottom didn't fall out to 10. Yeah, I was going to say 10. A lot of investors were still trying to hold on. Mm -hmm. A lot of the banks was still, still trying to figure it out. So for me, it was the perfect storm. I was in a situation. I was watching the market crash. I didn't have any cash to buy, but nobody else didn't either. Right? Once I started accumulating a little cash and started buying in 2009, 2010, it was I was getting them dirt cheap. I was my first house that I bought again in 2009 was a single family house. I still I still own this house. One two nine zero four Angeles. I paid ninety six hundred dollars. It was a lady already living there. The house she didn't was renting. No work. It's worse. It was her house. She had been there thirty years. That's why I still own it. By the way, she had been there thirty years. She had paid her mortgage off. I bought it at the tax auction. Mm. She stopped paying her mortgage. She stopped paying her taxes. See, I, I hate to say this, but it's information that the right people will take advantage of it and the wrong people is nothing they can do about it. When you give somebody a mortgage and you say, hey, pay this $1,000 every month. And in this $1,000, your property taxes and your insurance is in it. And they're doing that because most of us are machines, right? Yes. It's easy for us to become machines. You're doing that for 30 years. And then when you pay your last mortgage. You celebrate. Yeah. You celebrate. You don't even know that you need to pay property taxes every six months because nobody ever told you. That was your first house. The bank never told you. You don't even know what the escrow was for. You don't even know because you've never seen it. You never got the tax bill because it went directly to the bank. Mm. Next thing you know, you look up and you two years behind on your property taxes. And for the average American, we already know the average American got what, 600 saved up? Yeah. She got hit with a $4,000 tax bill. It wasn't no way she was going to buy. So I bought that house at the tax auction for 9600 Unfortunately, it was the original lady that was in the house. And I told her, listen, how much was your mortgage? She said $600, $599. I said, give me $650. Stay in the house until you put yourself in a situation to buy it back. That was 12, 13, 14 years ago. Unfortunately, she haven't. But I told her I'll never sell the house. That's all right. I'll never sell it. Because she said she wanted to die in it. I said, you know, I'm, I'll never sell the house. Hopefully, you can buy it back from me one day. But to this day, she, she unfortunately yeah, she's hasn't bought it. She's 650 money. Yeah. She's, that's that's yeah. her max problem. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. unfortunately, but that's, listen, somebody got to, you know, somebody got to be the producer. Yeah. Because there's too many consumers. Unfortunately, that's that's the reality. So, that was house one, mm -hmm. 2009. 
2000. I bought that one in 2009. And so the past 13, 14 years, mm-hmm. you've bought and sold hundreds. Um, the last count, the last count we did was two years ago. I was over 350. But that's not just single. You you do a lot of commercial, commercial, too. and I want that's where I want to go. Yes, sir. Right, but that's a lot of single family, multi family commercials. Mm-hmm. Like you do everything. Yes, sir. Right. What got you from single family mm-hmm. to family to what we see you doing now? Um, I would say this. I've been blessed. It, I, I have to add this where you can understand my mindset. I truly believe that I am a free thinker. I was raised in an environment that my father was a hustler, businessman, um, pimp, uh, bootlegger, after hour joints. He bought his, he bought literally, he had the second largest black owned hotel in Cleveland, Ohio. So he was the one that kicked in the door to let us know we can do whatever we want to do, right? Um, my mother, I never seen her every. The only work I've ever seen her done was for herself. I've never seen my father work for anybody else. I've never had a job in my life past the age of 18. I had a job for at Jaga Lake for about three months. <laughs> and I worked at um, the Brown Stadium for about three hours, both when I was 15. Mm. Since the age of 16, I've never had a job in my life. Even in prison, I was able to manipulate my way out of working in prison. So anybody that's been to prison, you know how hard that is. I never worked in the cafeteria, never worked in OPI, never did any of that. I use that time for myself every time, right? So by my nature, all I know is entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. right? Hustling. By doing that, in my mind, I said, you know, I, I I never thought with restrictions, right? You know, most people haven't gotten to commercial real estate because they think that is is they think from a restrictive mindset. Correct. For me, it was just real estate. Real estate is real estate. Mm-hmm. Residential, commercial, mixed use, it's all the same. Empty lots is is all the same. What's what's the difference? It's all you buy it, you fix it, you sell it, you rent it, you build it, you do whatever. So I never came from that restraint. I seen my father own buildings, commercial property. I seen people around me own commercial property because I was I was raised in Midtown, 68th and Carnegie. So we had some heavy hitters in that area that owned real estate, big boy stuff. You know, a lot of the people wouldn't understand. We're talking about in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. We had a guy named Winston Willis, originally from Detroit, but it relocated to Cleveland, Ohio, that owned the strip. We talking about in the sixties and seventies, he owned every building on the block. Sound like you? <laughs> That's why I aspire to be. <laughs> Sounds like you. My father used to take me to his businesses when I was a kid. We'll pull up and go to his movie theater, the Scrumpty Dump. We'll go to one of his eight nine restaurants. Go to one of his clothing stores. He literally owned a strip on the hundred five between Euclid and the Carnegie, and he owned every building on the block and we're talking about in the 70s bro wow so being exposed to that seeing that it was just a natural occurrence you know what i mean it was a i knew i was going to be in real estate one day i just didn't know i was going to do it as early as i did because i was caught up in the streets mm-hmm. i was getting the easy street money my father died when i was young okay. so that whole part of my life it disappeared really quickly i never got a chance but my father was taking me he took me to the tax auction when i was like 13 14 he was already in it he was he had been buying properties at the tax auction that's why i tell people in real estate that act a little scared when they say they don't want to sell nothing why not you can't buy it again As long as consumers are put into a situation that they got to pay bills every month or every six months, they're going to lose property. Yeah. Yeah. Period. It's not a black thing or a white thing. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's it's a, it's a consumer mentality. College teaches people to think in that box. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So for me, the commercial thing, it was just, it was, was, but how did you go from though? mm Because here's, here's the thing. It's a it's really popular right now where people mm-hmm. say, man, we starting in commercial yeah, real estate. Yeah. That's what I do. I'm a commercial yeah. real estate agent. Yeah. But there is a little bit of a transition. There is a little bit of not just mindset though, right? And I'm a, I'm gonna tell you why I say money, that. Money, money, right? It's more expensive. It's more money. And yeah. then even understanding how to analyze 
your strip center versus a single family? It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier? A lot easier. Why? Because think think about it. When I started off, I was paying rent, mm -hmm. right? I was paying somebody rent. You can easily, the, with technology, that's the beautiful thing. Any information is at the end of our fingertips, right? You can go on and Google commercial mortgage. Mm -hmm. And it'll easily tell you 15 to 20% down, this is what your payment will be. I guarantee, let, let's, let's take it to this level. I guarantee, I challenge every business owner out there, wherever you're renting that, wherever they're paying rent that, I pretty much can guarantee 80% of those individuals, especially if they're in a single unit property or a plaza, if they go to that commercial, Google commercial mortgages, right? I guarantee whatever they built out for that business yes. to open that business and whatever they're paying in rent, that was the down payment on that building, and they're paying the mortgage on that property. If they're not paying the mortgage in full, they're paying above 60% of that landlord's mortgage. So, and I hate to put that information out there because my tenants, you know what I mean? But I'm not going to say I hate it. I, I really love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I really love it. But hopefully I will lose some tenants because that's what I'm, I'm listening. And people know what's funny. I was just talking to one of my property managers and one of the gentlemen at um, my plaza. I got an 11-unit plaza over in Euclid. And the gentleman was running into some problems, right? I guess his um, furnace went out, and that's their responsibility to repair it. But it, it was above what he had saved up. And he had been there three years. And I said, look, um, when they reached out to me, they was like, well, you know, their, their mindset was, well, he got to go. I was like, well, hold up. Let's think about this mm -hmm. correctly, right? He's in a five-year lease. He got about three years left on his lease. If we kick him out and have to put a new tenant in, What's the odds of me renting it out in a month or two months? It might take three months, worst case scenario, to rent that space out. We don't know what type of work is going to be needed. Whoever comes in, most likely they're going to look for some free rent. Mm -hmm. They're going to ask for build-out time, which most um, tenants should do, right? They're going to ask for 90 days build-out time. So let's look at where I would be at if we let him go and where I can be at if I just go ahead and fix the um, furnace for him. And put it on the back end of his rent or charge him an extra $50 a month, right? So that's what I told them to offer. Reach back out to him. Tell him I'll fix the furnace. Let me send my guy over there, which I know he's going to give me the best deal. I have the wholesale connect on furnaces, right? So I'm going to get the bottom line price and whatever it costs, we'll add it on to his rent. They reached out to him, made that offer to him. He said, you know what? I'm just in a bad place. I just, you know, I, I can't do it. What is it going to cost to get out of my lease? I said nothing. Hand the keys back to him. You got 48 hours. Hand the keys back to my people and he can go. Wow. Yeah. He's a good landlord. I'm a great landlord because the great thing about me, I've been on the other side of it. Yeah. I've been a tenant dealing with a-hole landlords, landlords that don't understand business. I lost my first. I didn't lose. I walked away from my first restaurant space on Carnegie. When I came home this time, I was doing great. I'm walking outside. I just bought a Navigator cash, black Navigator. <laughs> And the landlord was walking past. He said, hey, King, I, I see you doing really well. You got lines at the door. So you just bought a new truck. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, man. I'm doing real good. He said, yeah, you know I'm going up on that rent when the lease is over. I said, no, you're not. He said, oh, I'm, I'm going up. I said, I'm going to move then. He said, no, nah, you ain't, you ain't going to leave this place. You're doing too good. I said, watch me. And he did. He tried to go up on the rent when the lease was over and I went and bought a building. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. He pushed me quicker than I was ready to go. I went and bought my first restaurant building. So you were leasing and then went and bought one. I went and bought one. Two years later, I went and bought my own building. And that was my first restaurant building, 39th Superior. Let's go back to single family to commercial. To commercial. Right? You really push it, mm -hmm. commercial. Yeah. Right? We do single family. Mm-hmm. Why do you push commercial so hard? Push it to people or push it myself? To yourself and people. Because you, I mean, when you talk about it, you're pushing it to us. Well, for me, it was, and again, listen, I, I don't want to sit here and put commercial over residential. Correct. Right? Because that's really not the reality. 
A lot of people look at me and I, I hear the comments. People walk up to me and say, man, I want to do commercial. I want to because they see me doing it on social media. But the reality is this. This is it's all about the deal. Mm -hmm. It's all about the deal. Residential, commercial, vacant lot. I don't care what it is. It's all about that ROI. What's going to be the return on your investment? Me, I'm just one of those people that I've all, I'm always trying to evolve. I'm always trying to stay motivated in some yes. type of way. So for me, I made the conversion. Was it uh, was residential more headaches? Yeah. Did I get more phone calls from, you know, not me personally, but my property management team? Did they get more issues and chase more rent with residential? Yeah. But that's as a landlord. But you flip. You like I flip commercial. You too. flip commercial as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So as a landlord, mm -hmm. I get people argument, right? More mm -hmm. the toilet kind of went out with commercial. Yeah, yeah, they manage yeah. their own. They manage their own. They but the way you that. flip commercial, man, it's mm -hmm. like us flipping. And again, I do ninety percent residential. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It's like most people that flip residential. You flip commercial. I you do. flip a I lot do. of. You just posted that uh, video, and you was mm -hmm. going through like buildings. Yeah, yeah. What gives you that? Like you got like a superpower for that though. It's man. not. It's not. It's I not, really it's don't. It's not a superpower. Bro. It goes back to if I can do what you can do it. It's just a natural. Listen, it's a market for every type of real estate out here. Now, what I will say is, is less people in the commercial game. Why Even when that? I was going because fear, fear, information, lack of information, lack of knowledge, lack of confidence. People thinking in a box. They're not free thinkers. Listen, this is no exaggeration. I bought some really, really big deals. Some The returns was unbelievable at the foreclosure auction in Cleveland, right, with commercial real estate. I noticed when I was in the room, it would be 200 people in the room bidding on properties. Mm -hmm. It's 500 properties on the list. But on the commercial properties, there's only two or three people. I was the only African-American bidding on commercial properties in the room. Literally, the only one. It was two specific properties, probably um, two of the biggest um, returns that I ever received on commercial deals. It was a five-unit plaza. It's, the bidding started at $62,000. I went down there with 200000 That was my limit that I was willing to pay for this property. When the bidding started, I stood up and said, be it. Now, one other person bid it in the room. Follow this. This is a five-unit plaza, 100% occupied. Tenants in there paying rent every month. $62,000. $62,000. The day that I bought it, within, I had to wait till it transferred. The day that it transferred, I collected $5,600. So in 12 months, you get all your money back. That literally, just because people are investors, so to speak, because honestly, the reality of it, if 200 people were in that room every month for the auction, right, yes. only 50 are real buyers, mm -hmm. right? And out of those 50, probably 30 is only buying one property. They blowing their whole wide, right? Yeah. The other ones might buy the other out of the, the the 20, only three are even buying commercial properties. And the ones out of the three that's buying commercial properties, they're only gonna buy one. The name of your podcast is what? Delayed gratification. Gratification. Yes. I am the example of that. What does that mean? What does delayed gratification mean to you? It means this, that when I made my first $100,000, I could have bought another car. I could have traveled to Turks and Caicos. I could have went to Dubai. I could have bought Louis and Gucci. I promise you, bro, that first hundred grand I made, 99000 went back into reinvesting. That's what it means to me. But again, listen, that's why I said the last prison stint was a blessing. Mm. Because while I was in prison, a light bulb went off. 
and said, damn, I can live wearing these same two pair of pants and these same shirts and these four pair uh, uh, boxer briefs and these four pair of socks and these same shoes every years. day and live out this box for five and a half years. And I'm still a man. It does not make me less than a man. I still have the respect of my family and my peers. Well, why I can't transfer this to the street? What's the difference? Why, why not put all the other stuff to the side for a minute and be focused and disciplined and get that cash? And the difference was, too, when I went to prison, all the stuff that I say I had, the club, the building, the houses, all that, I told you I lost everything in a year and yeah. a half. Why did I lose it? I was up to here in debt. I didn't understand the debt play. I didn't respect the debt play. I thought debt was the American way, which most people think. Until I learned cash is king. I'm not trying to knock anybody's game mm -hmm. on the debt play. This is the path for me. Cash is king. I don't play the debt game. At all. Don't get me wrong. I have out of. 300 and 300 plus real estate purchases, 350, over 350 real estate purchases. I financed three, mm. three commercial buildings, three. Why did you finance those? Quick story. I, I've been, I walked into uh, me and my dude was like, man, this uh, restaurant just opened. Let's go up here and check it out. The dude, the owner, used to work for me. I wanted to see how much of the menu we stole. <laughs> so we walked in the restaurant, sat at the bar. Um, the guy comes out. Oh, man, what's up? He see me. Thank you for social media, my brand. I'm blessed. That he said, oh, man, what you, what you doing in here, King? You, what you about to buy the building? I'm like, oh, is the building for sale? He like, yeah, I heard he was selling it. I was like, oh, okay. I took that that little tidbit that he said. I left. I had my um uh my people run a check, get the owner's information, reached out to him and said, yeah, I heard the building's for sale. Yeah, it is. I, we sat down and talked. Couldn't get a deal done. It took I'm jumping. It took two years to finally get the deal done. COVID hit. So this recently. This was Maybe re well. This three was, years ago. Yeah, really. when COVID first hit, you know, do eighty. 80-year-old Jewish dude that owned the building for 30 plus years. COVID hit. His son was like, called me up and said, Hey, this is um Armin's um son. I said, okay. He said, I want to come, I want you to come in and talk to me about that property you've been chasing my dad about. I said, All right, let's do it. I went in, he said, Listen, man, I'm I'm trying to force my dad out of retire into retirement to enjoy his life. He's 80 years old. COVID is hit. He shouldn't be dealing with this stuff. Tenants up there that they don't want to pay. He having major problems. Are you still interested in the building? Absolutely. Cash. We negotiated the cash deal. I'll get the numbers. 430000 right? I was prepared to buy cash. I had the cash. Right? Um, I was in the process of selling two apartment buildings at the same time, two six-unit twin buildings on 142nd to a guy out of Colorado. We had negotiated the deal. At the last minute, I found out that he was using finance. And I said, listen, I don't want to do the financing game because with commercial financing deals, they take a long time. How did, why did I think that? Because the last time I financed a commercial building was my building I had the restaurant in Carolinas before I went to prison. It took almost a year. It took like nine or 10 months. It was a very stressful situation. So that was the only information that I had based on my experience. He said, listen, man, this deal, who I deal with, First National Bank, it's like cash. We're going to close this thing in 30 days. Oh, that's impossible. He said, I'm telling you. I said, put up $10,000, non-refundable earnest money. And if we don't close in 10, 30 days, then you lose your money. He said, I'm willing to do it. I said, man, this dude crazy. You willing to give me 10 grand? He said, yeah, we got up to 30 days. He said, "He, I got the email. We need a little more time. Oh, no, you got to buy that time. We ended up closing the deal 35 days. Wow. When we went to the closing table, his bank rep showed up. I said, listen, when we done with this deal, I want to talk to you. He said, cool. I said, I'm in the process of buying some other commercial properties, using my own cash. I'm really not a fan of the commercial, you know, the, the finance game, but. You know, I'm going to send you over the numbers. Just let me know what the terms would be. 
He sent it over, 430000 He said, I put 20, 20% down, 85 grand, right? He said, your payment will be 1800 a month. I said, oh, hold up, man. This, this sounds too good to be true. <laughs> Interest rate was so sweet two it years ago. It was so sweet. Yeah. But I wasn't paying attention to that like that because I wasn't using finance, right? right? I said, man, if you, if you can do this deal, you know, I'm going to get it done. Make a long story short, I bought the building. I financed. I had a, always had A1 credit. So don't get it wrong just because I don't use that. My, for one point in time, my credit was locked for six years straight. Yeah, Six years straight. I I had to, I lost all the information to unlock my credit when I financed this deal. So don't get me wrong, I had I've I've had an 800 plus credit score for 10 years. Gotcha. But I came home with a 550 credit score. 550. But using it with credit cards, just little things, it built up, right? Very quickly. I financed a couple of cars early on too, right? Just because I have a relationship with my credit union to help them out and help my credit, right? So I know the credit building game. So I ended up getting the building. The, the day that I closed on the building, I collected $6,500. $6,500. From the tenants that was willing to pay. My note was $1,800. $1,810. Exactly. $6,500. My property manager went up there. The owner introduced her to everybody. I stood in the back. I'm just a contractor. You know, I, I do that all the time. I don't want people to know, but social media, people find out. Um, we walked through the spaces again. She collected checks, 6500 I said, this is a winner. Within seven months, I had full capacity to build and everybody was paying rent. I was at fourteen two on the property. 14200 So you basically got your money back in. Seven months. Nope. Gross. I was grossing fourteen two. Okay. After mortgage, property taxes, and insurance, I was profiting ten thousand six hundred dollars every month. I kept that building for two years, and then I sold it for a million dollars. You just sold it. I sold it. I, no, I sold this. It's been eight months. That's what I'm saying. You just sold it recently. Yeah, yeah, eight, eight months. months. Yeah, yeah. So you, I kept it for two years. So I you, didn't put. I, I put ten thousand dollars in the building, in terms of renovations. I put a roof on one of the spaces. That's it. So I bought it for four thirty. Really, I only put eighty five grand down. Okay. So I only had ninety five thousand invested in the building. I received every dollar of my investment back plus because I was profiting ten thousand six a month, and then I sold it for a million. Man, you made like six hundred, seven hundred k. <laughs> that was sweet. With that financing. With that financing. So don't get me wrong. I'm not completely against finance. So when we got that deal done, I ended up financing two other commercial properties that I knew that I bought for the short play. Mm -hmm. Right? And it, and it was, for me, I had the cash, but I was doing other things with the cash. And I'm glad I didn't tie up the money in that property because other deals that came my way and I was able to execute on those deals because I had the cash. So now... I'm going to go back to something that we see a lot. Mm -hmm. No money down stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think your banker and you're so successful in that commercial because you always had a cash somewhere? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. your cash. Yes. So what do you think about this no money down? Does it work when you're talking about your bankers? The bankers that you've met, no. your credit union, no. does not work? No. No. And I've never heard of no money down on commercial properties, only on residentials. I've never heard of it. With my banker is fifteen to twenty percent down, depending on the numbers, the numbers play of the building. Yeah, and I, I tell people all the time, like you need to be prepared to have twenty to twenty five percent exactly sitting somewhere in yeah. commercial real estate. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, this is something that I learned in the process of dealing with commercial property. I think is very important because it was important information for me. It's a lot easier to finance a, a a million plus commercial property than it is a million less commercial property. Why? Because with a million less, they go by your personal financials. You have to show two to three years of personal financials, 20% okay. down. Obviously, as low as 15% now, de depending on the deal. With a million plus, they only go by the income of the property. Are you saying purchase price a million plus or loan amount a million plus? Uh, purchase price. Purchase price a million plus. Purchase price a okay. million plus. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Purchase price a million plus. So if you put 200 grand down and you show that this property is producing enough income that will triple your expenses with the property, it's a done deal. 
So, like, for example, the property that you just sold for a million plus. The guy who I sold it to went through my bank, who you I bought it through. Huh? You took them there? Of course. Okay. I introduced them to the people. And they were yeah. fine with that? Yeah. they Because it was a property I already had in the house. They already knew the numbers. They already knew the deal. So, they financed him. So, I, I got to say this, though, man. With mm-hmm. commercial real estate, I've seen you almost completely own a major street in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. You're developing it. You're putting new. That's exaggerated. It's not the whole street. It, it the a street lot of is long. It's now. a lot of buildings. It's There's a lot, lot of buildings that you own. Yeah, man. it's nine properties. Nine. Yeah. Okay. What's the plan? Um, Black Wall Street, bro. Black Wall Street. What does I'm, that mean? I'm, I'm, in, I'm inspired by Winston, Winston Willis. I'm inspired by the real Black Wall Street. I'm inspired to show other people if I can do it, you can do it too. Um, Cleveland is not like Atlanta, right? That's one of the reasons why I relocated Atlanta to, um, the, the energy for people of color here is you can't get it any other place in the United States of America, nowhere. Detroit is probably the closest place you can get it. Um, and it's a numbers game. That's why you, um, Atlanta has, Atlanta and the surrounding areas have a lot more African-Americans or people of color than Cleveland, Ohio do. In Cleveland, we have heavy hitters. Don't mm-hmm. get it wrong. We got we got um, men and women doing their thing, but they're doing it individually and in pockets. As much as you preach it, yeah, yeah, they're they're doing it individually and in pockets. It's 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 it's. I'm not the only one in the city making moves, right? You you got plenty of guys yeah. making moves and women making moves, right? But they're spread out. We're not bringing that Peter Street energy that College Park Main Street energy, right? Because that's where, when I came to Atlanta uh, nine years ago and went on Peter Street, it was amazing. while my people went in the restaurant, I was outside on the curb with my mouth dropped, just bathing in the glory of every one of these businesses are black owned? Yeah. How was that even possible? Yeah. Who came up with that? Who led that charge? That's who I want to meet. And right around the corner from Pascal's, which is, you know, for me as a business owner, a black restaurant owner, and a real estate investor, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? That's that's history, brother. So I, ever since I experienced Peter Street, I I, I will I, I I've talked about it in Cleveland, doing something like that. Why we can't bring that energy? Because we have literally five or six areas in Cleveland that's like that. But they're not minority owned, not one. So do you think, I mean, because you lead the chart, you lead by example. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you got some heavy hitters yeah. in Cleveland, yeah. right? Yeah. I always feel great, I guess, because who I come to Cleveland, you know, you beyond. I mean, yeah. I always, it's always like I feel mm-hmm. like it's the same energy, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. So what does it take to take that street and make it Peter Street in the next three to five years? I need a couple of other individuals in Cleveland with the money, with the credibility, with the know-how to join me on Buckeye to get lead that charge. I can't do it by myself. You know, I can I can throw all the money in the world at it, but money doesn't resolve all issues. We need the energy but too. When you say we need to commit join you, you gotta, you know, you the visionary. Yeah, yeah. So what does that look like though? Well, that looked like me buying nine properties on the street. And somebody else myself buying. and somebody else buying one or two. Or three, and don't get me wrong. I have a couple of individuals that's already doing it. We right. we have, I I've already invited four or five people over, and they own properties over there. So now it's just creating that energy. Now buying the real estate that's easy, but now we got to open up the businesses. Okay, and if I have to do it, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. I'm I'm willing to bring some of my brands over there, some of my businesses, and lead that charge for sure. So so that's that's the way you. Because I've seen it, mm-hmm. again, been very inspired. But you help a lot of people get into business. Yeah. Like I've seen you do a giveaway. Like it was like a, um, was like a grant or something. Somebody was going to win and you was going to give like some money for them to start. Oh, that's I mean, one of my guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so I just participated in it. So you just participated in it. Yeah. What does that look like? Should it be more of that? Um, or can it be more of that? No. I'm going to be honest. I'm not... Um, I know this is going to sound a little harsh, but I'm not a huge fan on just giving money away. Okay. I'm a fan of giving information away. 
Because to me, the information and the knowledge is way more important than the money. Mm. It's way more important. You you know this. You 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 can walk out of here and give ten grand to somebody walking by, but if that person don't have the mindset, yeah. that ten grand will be gone in an hour. I have it. I have people in my own family that I so called tried to set up, set them up for the legacy play, you know, for the generational wealth and. It's the mindset. It's the information, man. It's the knowledge. I, w- I was a perfect example of that. I'm a hustler, so I was always able to get money, mm-hmm. but I didn't have the knowledge and information to manage that money when I got it. And that's the biggest mistake we make. Everybody's always chasing the dollar, but you chase the, chase the information, chase the knowledge. What are you going to do with the dollar when you get it if you don't have the information, the right information? Not just... 20 seconds from social media information. You need the whole story. And that's the problem with social. So here's a challenge, though. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a challenge. Not many people talk to us like you talk to us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And talk to us, and they do it. Yeah. See, a lot of times we see things, and it's like they're teaching from a theory, mm-hmm. but not practical yeah, or real of doers. Of course. So yeah, how, how do we get more of a king? I'm, I'm, listen, one thing that I know for sure they're out there, okay? Because I follow them on social media. I'm not following just the guys that's just, you know. I got you. Putting up 20, <laughs> 30 seconds. I'm following real people that, uh, you know. And listen, we we know this for a fact. I, I, and I can probably, I'm willing to bet, majority, majority, over half of the people that's on social media claiming, trying to teach others, actually never did it. Mm-hmm. People that's che- teaching the game on how wealthy people set up their own personal bank from insurance never did it. Mm -hmm. When they start off, this is how wealthy people do it. This is how rich people do it. Guess what I know immediately? They're not wealthy and they're not rich. So how are you going to teach somebody something that you don't know? Something you read in the book or something you got off somebody else's podcast. So that's the first mistake. Social media is something that's uncontrollable at this point, right? You got real, you got mm-hmm. authentic on there, but you got so much fake. You have to try to, you know, navigate through it all. And that's very difficult. But you have to do it. You have to take the extra time to check credibility. You have to see who's actually doing the thing that they teach and like beyond like to say. Yeah. You know, I I do that thing. You do it for I real. I really do it. And yeah. I've been doing it. And that's and that's the difference. Um, I get a game up. People reach out to me for more information all the time. I try to respond to questions, but I try to give up as much information as possible. Try to be, I remember one of my dudes um, probably 12 years ago when I came <clears throat> home, he bought a, a, a convertible S-Class and he w- I seen him. We crossed paths in the hood one day. I'm like, bro, what you, what you doing riding through the hood? He said, if we don't come through the hood, to let these people know that they can do it and they can get it legitimately, who else going to do it? Mm. If they only see the drug dealers and the robbers and the street dudes driving the fly stuff, That's what they right? Do. Yeah. And I say, oh, man. Next thing you know, I come through in the Rolls Royce, the Maserati, <laughs> you know what I mean? Dudes yelling out the window, man, what you doing in the hood with the Rolls Royce? I'm doing me. I'm doing me, bro. Why Cleveland? Why? Because Cleveland, mm-hmm. so listen, I posted something, man. And sometimes I be want to tag you and beyond and say, man, can y'all respond to these people for me? Because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm still growing up a little bit, so yeah. I don't want to say mm-hmm. the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. But this dude, I posted a triplex. Okay. And uh, I was like, man, great opportunity in a great mm-hmm. city. Mm-hmm. This dude went on a rant, man. He got a little pull on social media to Cleveland. I ain't, you know, he just, and I didn't respond to him. Okay. Right. Cause I understand if you respond back to me, I respond to you. It's just, mm-hmm. it's unnecessary. Right. Well, sometimes it's conversation. It can be positive. No, nah, he, nah, he, nah, he didn't. Nah, that went with the, him and his partner was looking for. Okay. They, okay. You know what I mean? So, okay. I wish tell, I would have seen that. I'll tag you in it. Yeah. But yeah, tell yeah. me, cause I understand Cleveland is a great city. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But why would I come to Cleveland to start? to help with Buckeye, the Black Wall Street of Cleveland. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. Let's 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 talk let's talk reality. Okay. It ain't about you coming to help Buckeye, it's about Buckeye helping you. Okay. I would never ask anybody to come and invest 
in the city or neighborhood or street or property unless they're going to benefit too. This ain't a donation. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I would only in, be investing my money if I seen that I'm going to make money. That's the reality. So this ain't all charity work. Don't get it twisted because I do charity work and I call it charity work. When you do it. This is real estate investing. It's just a smart play. We're trying to do what all these non-African Americans has been doing. Forever. They target an area. They invest in it for the long play. What, what's the difference? Hmm. Now we're betting on ourselves with our own money, with our own energy. That's what this play is. It's never charity, bro. Because I'm not just going buy nine properties on the property for uh, on, on the street for charity. You know what I mean? That wouldn't make any sense. How much money do we need to make Buckeye Peter Street? Um, like if you had to, if you had to say, you know what? Because it, like you said, it's a long street. Yeah. Like what yeah. would you say is one somebody, individual can come up there and and with two hundred grand? And actually, let, let's take it back because reality, everybody is not playing like I play with okay. cash, right? Somebody can come up there with a hundred grand and make an impact if you finance it. Can you help us with financing? Can do you have? Like I can. A, I can. I point can me in the right direction. One thousand percent. Okay. I can make introductions. Can I do your? Can I do your three year tax returns for you? No. 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 <laughs> I can't be your accountant. I can't be your attorney. I can't do all. All I can do is lead the horse to the water. The horse, you got to drink it. I got a hundred k. Great credit. Yes. But I live in Hawaii. Yes. Right. But I want to do business in Cleveland. Yes. I like the vision. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's so many opportunities in Cleveland, man. It's still yeah. a gold mine, it's, right? It's phenomenal. It's a gold mine. Yeah. What do I do next? Can you, you help me find a building? Come, come to Cleveland. Absolutely. Come to Cleveland. Put boots on the ground. I'm, I'm one of them guys. Like, um, you know, me and Beyond is the same in that regard. Like, can I sell you something sight unseen? Yeah, but. I'm not comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I want to give you as much information as I possibly can. Where if it don't work for you, you can never in your mind think that a king set me up for this or put because it's still an investment. It's yes. still, it's no guarantee. I'm not going to guarantee anything, but I will listen. I've done over 350 real estate deals in the last 13 years. I've only lost money one time. One time, I lost $1,000. I broke even a second time. So I got to be doing something right. Yes. I got to be. So I pat myself on the back with that. You know what I mean? Have I lost some time on the deal and broke even? Yeah, one time. I lost $1,000 one time. And I can pinpoint exactly what mistakes I made with both of those deals. You made never mistakes. Made. I made two mistakes. Okay. Guess what? The one that I lost $1,000, guess what the biggest mistake what? was? I brought in a partner. Okay. And I was trying to worry about their feelings and their input on the deal and allowing them to give me input. And I wanted them to feel like they were a part of. And instead of doing what I was doing, I didn't allow my ego to get away, but I should have said, listen, you investing with me because my success and who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. Let me drive this car and you just ride passenger. But I didn't. And we ended up losing a thousand dollars. The other deal, same thing that I broke even on, I brought in a partner. Same exact same situation. So will I do partners again? Yeah, but you're partnering with me for a reason. Because you got the system and the formula. Let me lead this charge, you ride back seat. Period. Or you can ride in the passenger seat and learn the game, but I can't. Every time I deal with a partner and I try to worry about their input and their feelings and let them be a part of the, the, the way that we go, the path that we walk, it's a mistake. I did it in the restaurant business twice. Both times, mistake. Mistakes, both times. I can't I can't do that. So you got you to lead the way. I believe in me. Is it somebody smarter than me? Yeah, yeah. But that's the person that I'll be partnering with. Right? I'm looking to partner with that person. But if you're looking to partner with me, it's for a reason. So let me do what I do. Would you take partners on, Buckeye? On, on, on new um, potential projects? I will. I will. If it's if it's some value. I'm not money is not it, it has to be more than money. I don't need the money. Money is not, you know, that somebody has to be bringing more to the table than money. Than money. Unless you're bringing all the money, you're going to cash me out 
And now I'm in it with no money. And now I'm working for us as I'm working. I am working for our partnership. Okay. But I'm not going to, I have the money, all the buildings over there. Every last one of them is paid for free and clear. So <laughs> it don't make sense to bring in partners at this point, and unless and it makes sense. Got you. That's the only way that works. Got you. Got you. Listen, man, it's been a pleasure. It's a lot more that I wanted to talk about, man. But this is gonna have to be. See, you should be charging a hundred grand for your conference in Cleveland, but we're gonna talk about that off 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 camera. Yeah. Uh, but I I really appreciate you taking the time, man, to come up here. What you have given us today gonna change somebody's life. So I hope so, King, bro. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Hey, listen, y'all. Thank y'all for watching another episode of Delayed Gratification. I'll see y'all on the next episode.